All right, so we are live. I've got Travis Sago here. Uh, he's a coach, mentor of mine. Uh, he's an author, marketer, um, driven millions of dollars in revenue for his own offers, uh, other people's offers as well. But yeah, Travis, thanks for joining me. I know you don't do too many podcasts uh, since you're pretty busy, uh, but I'm actually just kind of curious, like how would you describe what you do to uh, people uh, normally? Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, um, I'm happy to be here. I'm actually not that busy. I don't stay busy. I have a pretty clear calendar. And part of the way I keep clear calendars is by saying n -n no a lot to, to people and things I really don't want to do. Right. So. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, I can be a little bit long winded. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to do the, the short thing. So. Uh, I've always been entrepreneurial, but I worked for, you know, a salary or a wage up until I was about in my mid thirties, um, did entrepreneurial stuff in between there. Some businesses crashed and burned them and all that kind of stuff. And then the internet came around and, uh, I cut my teeth as an affiliate. Mm -hmm. and I think that was a great training because it wasn't so much the internet. I mean, the internet, I don't know if I would ever figured it out without the internet, but I, I started roughly figuring out before, right as the internet got started, that um, I was never going to be famous, <laughs> right? Um, I'm not particularly charismatic on camera, um, you know, so that's probably, I wasn't sports minded, right? Um, I wasn't particularly really that great at anything except kind of understanding people and, and writing some, right? And to me, that was just like, okay, well, what the hell? My, my dad was a carpenter, right? And so if you didn't have calluses on your hands and, you know, like writing wasn't work, right? Like, you know, so, um, but I kind of got that. And so when I took the affiliate marketing, I'm like, dude, this is awesome. There's all these audiences out there. There's all these products out there. And all I got to do is match make and marry them up right and just put my put my copy in between right and i tried video and everything because around 2005 2006 when this video was starting to get popular but i was terrible at it so i just stuck to my ugly ass writing <laughs> right and i would put up the most ugly low rent landing pages you would ever think right but they converted like crazy and i knew people couldn't believe it. They're like, what the hell? Right. But I'm just really good at looking at an audience and what is the thing? What is their desperate problem? What is the thing that if you gave them like two glasses or two uh, bottles of wine or uh, two glasses of wine or two bottles of beer, like they really want, but they don't really want to talk about it. Right. And I would just connect them up with products to do that. I was selling things like little giant ladders, of course, a lot of info products restaurant coupons. Um, uh, there's a time there was an affiliate program for this thing called Video Professor. Um, that's probably before your time, but it was, <laughs> you know, older people learn how to use computers and stuff, right? Um, and I had like a dozen lists going, right? And right. of course, it was just kind of like, ah, oh, I had all these lists going on, but I would just connect those up and then kind of earn the commissions uh, in between there. Yeah, um, I finally had the narrow down right and I, I picked relationships and business um and those were kind of my niches right um and then i came out with some of my own products and though that's great too having I'm, I'm not against having your own products but i'm still prefer to be autonomous like an autonomous affiliate and you be the, the guy behind the scenes uh you know being a wingman on offers or like i was we were talking about an auction one of my guys is running right now and I'm just kind of like the auction wingman. I'm like, no, change your copy here. Right. Okay. They're, they're saying this, like say this in the comments. Right. And he's got, he's got like an $11,000 bid right now. Uh, on That's auction. Exciting. He started this morning just for some coaching. Yeah. Right? And he's got dozens of leads thousand, you know, I'll give you a thousand. I'll give you 5,000. I'll give you 7,000. I'll give you, you know, whatever. And he's got somebody in the PM said, I'll go up to 25 grand. Right. So 
but he'll end up doing business with all those guys, right? Um, that raise their hand, right? So the auction is not just about the winning bid, right? But my whole point is I, I much prefer to be the guy behind the scenes, right? The, the wingman yep. behind that. And that's, that's kind of what I do to, to this day, right? I do a lot of licensing, which people don't, it seems like this big complicated thing, but licensing is just advanced affiliate marketing. That's all licensing is. Instead of selling me selling somebody's ninety nine dollar product for fifty percent, I go get licensing rights to it. I tweak it and I change it, right? And I sell it for nine hundred and ninety nine dollars, <laughs> right? And a lot of times I do it with somebody's own product and their list, right? So I use it's just like being a super smart or clever or resourceful affiliate. I go get somebody else's list. I look at the products they have on the collecting dust, right? We pull those out, mm -hmm. pull the dust off, reposition them, sell them back to their audience, right? Sometimes we're double or triple what they sold it for. And then I get uh, commissions from that, right? If, or if I'm get the licensing rights and I can get a hundred percent of the licensing rights, right? I also flip it. So I, so I put my stuff available for licensing so other people can sell it because I'm just after buyers, right? So if somebody's licensing phone the sales machine from me, I'm happy just to get the buyers, right? And I'm happy to give them the bigger piece of whatever they're selling. If they're selling it for three grand, great. Keep 90% of it, depending on their volume, right? Yep. I just want the buyers, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's the same concept of affiliate kind of style marketing, right? It's just more resourceful and we've just taken the, taken it out of the box, right? But it's still very autonomous. Like I don't have to show my face if I don't want to, <laughs> right? I don't have to worry about getting canceled, you know, those kind of <laughs> things, you know, right. uh, because I'm always, and Kevin, it's been like that since the beginning of time. There's always been the talent and the artists and there's promoters, right? There, you, there's agents, right? There's um, Mike Tyson and there's Don King that promotes it, right? Mm -hmm. There's uh, Elvis Presley and then his promoter was the Colonel, right? There's all these sports stars. They don't go out and get their own uh, shoe commercials. They have an agent that goes out and does that for them, right? So. I've always been that kind of like that agent or producer um, understanding who to marry with what and what words need to be said in between. Does that relate to what you talk about? How, you know, any sort of business, there's the distribution yep. as a product and what you do with that with Mike Tyson, Don King, like how would you kind of put that together? Yeah. So that's all you have really, right? You have people and a product. Right. And then you have the marketing or you have the messaging or the connection up of those two. Right. So you take Walmart. Walmart is distribution. They've got shelf space. Right. Um, of course, people with products want to put their shit on Walmart shelf all over the world. Right. Because they know it's going to sell. Right. The packaging now in the retail world is a little bit different. The messaging and marketing is is in the packaging. Right, what's on the shelf, and also the commercials and ads and everything, and the pre-selling. Another way to think about marketing is marketing is pre-selling, right? So the commercials and the ads—that's all the pre-selling when they're in the store, and then the packaging is kind of like the sales part, right? They'll call it branding or something like that, but that's kind yep. of still too more of the pre-selling, right? But then they have when you're sitting there looking at all the peanut butters. Right. And one says, uh, Jeff, the peanut butter choosy moms choose, right? That messaging put them number one for years, right? Uh, if, if that makes sense. So they're just connecting plain old peanut butter to moms, right? And does that make sense? So it does. Yeah. Every business is like that. I don't care how complicated it seems if it's nfts or it's still this it's still the yeah. same business most of those nfts that sold really well because somebody had an audience right and then somebody knew how to 
position it right yeah so that that was one of the uh biggest market or sorry just general business principles i learned from you i remember when i went to arkansas and we we're at the hotel and, and you talked about the casino of life yeah actually yeah. and that kind of makes me think of that you know as a business owner you know uh you don't have to do it all you just need to find the people who have the right cards so could you talk yeah. a little bit about that the casino of life? yeah i don't even consider myself a business owner really um i'm like trying to run an unbusiness uh i'm more of an investor right and and Yes, I invest my money, but more so what I'm really focused on and miserly with and careful where I, I focus it is my time and my energy, right? So I want to figure out if I'm going to write a Google document that's going to serve as a sales piece, where can I put it in flow that's going to just keep making me money over and over and over and over again, right? Or doing heavy lifting for me over and over and over again. I feel like the world is mine, the world is ours because intellectual property and especially marketing intellectual property is the most flexible asset in the world with what we can do with it. So I I kind of like feel for copywriters sometimes because they're like banging out copy for a one-time fee right? They're, they might be banging out an email for like $200 an email. I get it, right? But I make thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars off an email by licensing it out or doing a hybrid license of licensing it out rather than just saying, I'll write you this email. It may or may not convert, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, there you go, right? So if you're writing emails for 200 bucks a pop, like you've got to write, um, you've got to write what ten is a two thousand, right? So if you want ten thousand a month, you've got to write a hundred of those damn things every month just to make ten k a month. Like that's too much work for me, man. <laughs> right? I want to write one time. I want to write an email one time and have it make five grand a month, ten grand a month, right? And, and doing that by putting it into into the flow. Now we do a couple other things like where we have people respond back and we take them over to a virtual salesperson and they, yep. and they close it. Right. So there's a little bit of a hybrid there. Right. But I've got uh, my products out there, which are really, it's just really a product is just copywriting for the next thing. If you really think about it, I don't, I don't know if I'm getting too deep here, but your product should be the best marketing for whatever that you sell next. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yep. You know, I've got buyers coming through all the time because I've licensed out my product, which are really, again, marketing pieces for the next thing. Like, hey, how can I work with you? Hey, what can we do this? Hey, can we do that? Does that make sense? So, yeah, um, it's really I just never thought of it like that. But that's yeah. 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 Um, so I kind of feel for these copywriters, especially if they're good, that are just getting. You know, they're they're trading their most rare, scarce things that they can never get back, which is their time and their energy for the most abundant thing that they're printing trillions of dollars. They're just, they're just getting dirty paper money back or dirty di or digits, right? Um, and I know we need money to live, right? But I want to trade my time and energy for assets that I for an asset that we can put out there, right? So if we have the ability to write or understand marketing and we can put that, or even experiences, we can take our experiences out and put them into intellectual property, the the game just opens wide up for that, right? So. Yeah, I mean, my, my I'd say you, you changed my life in that way where I, I positioned myself more as a copywriter. I would just write pieces of copy, but just since learning PSM and doing this for people, it, it really shifted my thinking and how I think about assets I'm creating for yeah. people that I can reuse um, just like that. Yeah. I can't remember which beetle it was. I don't know if it was Paul McCartney or uh, which one it was or John Lennon. Um, they're like, Oh, we need a swimming pool. And he's like, let me write a song. Right. Let me write a song. And so he wrote a song got a swimming pool 
right? That's kind of like the way I view my life. It's like, okay, what do I need? What do I got to write? What assets do I got to put out there to get that, right? Um, and even better, once I've paid for the thing, then the money keeps coming in, right? Um, Elvis Presley died in 1977. And I know that because I was 10 years old and I was working on a, a little do-it-yourself radio kit, right? And I just built my first little radio out of one of these kits. And so we lived in Huntington Beach and we got KFI out of, I think it was out of Los Angeles. And I tuned it in. And that was the first thing that news broadcast that I heard on my radio is that Elvis Presley dies today, right? Um, so that's how I remember it. But he died in 1977. Any guess on how much money his branding and his songs earned his estate last year? I, I would say a lot. 30 mil, Jeez. 30 million bucks. And he's been dead since 1977. <laughs> um, Jimmy Buffett was one of the, I don't think he is now, but at one time he was one of the highest paid uh, singers, right? But he didn't make a billion dollars singing concerts. He made a billion dollars licensing out the Margaritaville logo, right? All over. I got some flip flops on it, right? On beach towels and clothes and even hotels and like everywhere they could put it. Same thing with uh, Gene Simmons was one of the outliers. He's a, he's the talent and he did his own business, right? So he had that yep. Kiss logo on lunch boxes and toys and everything, right? They made lots and lots of money through that, right? Yeah. So, um, and they're kind of tapping into di more distribution too. That's right. Absolutely. Right. They're helping other people sell their products. Right. What do you think? Of, how you think a beach towel sells better with a Margaritaville logo on it? Hell yeah. Like I brought my <laughs> flip flops, right? Do I get the plain old flip flops or the flip flops with the Margaritaville logo on it? I'm going to go Margaritaville. I like Jimmy Buffett. Right. So again, like every product, what, what every this can open up a lot of world and money for people. Every product owner is looking for more eyeballs. Everybody that controls eyeballs, whether you're the Walton family or whoever, everybody that controls eyeballs wants to solve problems for their audience. They want to solve problems for their audience, right? So once you know those two things, if you're the guy or the gal that can say, ooh, this here, this over here, and here's what we need to say, <laughs> right? That's all you gotta, that's all you gotta do, right? So um, we're, you, we're running auctions right <laughs> now in the Rockstar Group, um, and we're just getting started, but one of the first guys to run an auction, like most of the stuff he sold in the auction, he didn't own, he just got licensing rights. He that's got permission, some, some mm -hmm. of it was mine, right? I'm like, yeah. yeah use use my stuff right because what do i want i want eyeballs mm -hmm. right so he like he did have some of his own stuff in there but he made the package a lot better right by going to other people putting a whole package together that would solve his audience's problems right and then he he run the run the auction now if you're super resourceful <laughs> you don't even need to have your own he just run it on his profile yeah. right um if you're super resourceful, you just go find somebody that has a Facebook group or an Instagram that has the eyeballs, but they know mm -hmm. that their people have a problem. Then you go find the, the product and you, you don't have to give them any of the money if you like if you work it out because they just want the eyeballs, right? Right. So, and you just run the auction for them. Does that make sense? It does, right? yeah. And I'm not saying that the world should be about auctions. I'm just saying... This is the marketing in between the product and the people. And that marketing can be lots of things. It can be a Google document. It can be a poll. Mm -hmm. can, there's lots of things that it can be, right? But the whole, the world's a candy store when you kind of understand how it all works and you don't need money to begin. You don't need product and you don't. And it, hell, if you don't even know how to write copy, you don't even need that. You just have to understand how to put all the pieces together, mm -hmm. right? It's like a movie producer. Yep. What does a movie producer do? Does he act does in the do. movie? No. Does he hold the camera? No. Does he write the script? 
Usually not. Does he even fund the movie? Not usually, right? All he knows is the order to get things done and how to make it happen. That's all the movie mm -hmm. producer really knows. He's like, or she knows. She knows if I have a good script, that will attract top talent. Once I have top talent, if I can get Tom Cruise to do this, then I'll get the investor money, right? Then if I get the investor money, then the movie studios may take it on for distribution, right? So they, they know how to put it all together, but they don't have those talents themselves. And it actually hurts. Like, so I, I mentor a lot of people in this and it actually hurts them when they get to go get a deal and then they get bogged down writing all the copy. <laughs> like, I have to go write all the copy, right? No, go put more deals together, right? That's where the, that's where the money is, 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 is getting the assets, getting the assets under management, right? Not writing the emails or tapping the sales in, right? I'm not saying never to do that, if right? But that's not where the, that's not where the real money is. That's not where the money is an effective assets, right? So we want to get right. the faster we can get control of assets. Um, right. If we, somebody says, yeah, I'll license you my product. Right? And licensing just means give permission. I'll give you permission mm -hmm. to use my product for eyeballs, right? Like everything doesn't have to be about money, right? The world opens up and you realize, oh, what if I did this and just sent them all the leads, right? They'd probably be happy with that. Or just the exposure they're going to get yep. from getting this big influencer, right? Hell, like these companies are sending them samples half the time anyways, right? On physical products, right? Mm -hmm. Like, please, mm -hmm. please endorse me, right? I'll give you our new uh, golf simulator, even though it's 10 grand. If you'll, right, does that make sense, right? Yep. Um, so the idea that we need to, have this money to buy the product and give them some, like we take money out of the equation. Sometimes we see things a lot clearer, like what else is valuable other than the money for the audience owner. It's about solving a problem for their people, for their people that they know that their people have. Yeah. What's interesting to me is you're talking about the poll. Uh, I, I know you're a big reader. You, you like crowd psychology, uh, yep. crowd thinking. I'm just curious. What, what are some, psychology principles or uh uh yes psychology principles that come top of mind uh with the poll that's happening. so um i've just really probably over the last six months or so i've really just started using um polls right because we we've been like we, we use an email or we're in communities and we'll either say you know reply back Right. Or, you know, it could be go visit a web page or whatever it is, reply back or comment. Right. Or whatever we're going to do as a response mechanism. Right. Um, and it works OK. But I started using these polls and I'm like, man, if I get like 10 comments on a regular post, if I put it in as a poll, I'll get 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 yep. poll takers. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, the. the thing you have to do because they see other people voting on it and they want to be part of it right and it's just easier to punch a yeah. button they go down and make a comment <laughs> it's not and you're, you're not as in the limelight like i think a lot of your movers and shakers don't you know if you say hey do you want this thing to solve this problem they don't maybe not want to necessarily admit that they have the problem so this is some of the wording that you need to do whether you're doing polls or comments yeah. right but i noticed those comments would get way uh, the, the polls would get way like double, triple, quadruple what the comments would get. Now the, the twist to that, there's two twists to it uh, or problems with it. One, you have to know how to word the poll so that you're, uh, that you're getting buying intent with those poll answers, right? We'll talk about that here in a minute if you want to, but you get, For you're sure. getting buying intent. The second thing is how are you going to follow up with all those people, right? So we were doing polls in Facebook groups and such, and it's a pain in the ass because, like, you can reach out and message those people, 
but you have to be friends, mm -hmm. right? Um, and if you're going to get somebody else to help you, they have to be friends with them, right? Or they have to ha yeah. hit a page. So it's just, it's not very efficient. And then, so I started using school um, and, you know, I'm not saying it's the be all end all community. I, I think it's getting a little overhyped, but here's why I like it as a marketer. It's one of the, as a conversion engine, it's got more horsepower than anything I've done in 20 years. Um, the ability to make a post, have it email out to people and the ability to DM people. Um, God damn. So we, we make these mm -hmm. posts in there, right? And then I'll usually give them a, several options. And they, and they basically self-qualify or disqualify based on how they answer, right? Without making them feel bad. And then we just follow up. Mm -hmm with the people that raise their hands, right? Or answer the poll, right? We call it a phone, the sales machine or a yep. T3 system, right? Yep. Where we follow up, right? We, we ask them if they're still interested. We qualify them, right? With a couple of questions. And then we give them the offer typically in a Google document uh, mm -hmm. or in a video. And then they're like, I'm in, right? <laughs> um, but I can, in, in school, I can set somebody up as a moderator and they can go in and DM everybody that, answers the poll right um so like one of the polls that we just that we just ran there's only 440 people in the group um uh we had uh my numbers are a little bit confusing because it, it would stretch over time so i wanted to, i wanted to track what we did in the first 24 hours so the first 24 hours i believe we had um like uh 50 or 60 positive, mostly positive, I mean, the top positive response. And uh, so we reached out to him, we did 60 grand in deals, right? So we had 60, from 400 people, 60 leads, and we did 60 grand in deals in the first 24 hours. Um, and then we, we followed up with the second tier, and then we, we did some other posts and stuff in there to move them, you know, closer to the conversion hole. And we ended up with $186,000, right? Um, we collected about half of it in, in upfront payments from 400 people off of the polls. I've never generated leads and sales so fast using polls and the ability to, to reach out and DM the, the people that have answered the, the polls. No, no applications, no phone calls. No applications, no phone calls. No no shows. Um, yeah, no, no shows, right? <laughs> it's amazing. They like they, they don't, you, you know. And uh, I get a little high on my own supply sometimes, but I really think like sales calls are or they're always going to be around on some level. I mm -hmm. think, but people would much rather chat over DMs now. And I'm seeing more. I, I got a guy that that they do book a chat, <laughs> not book a call. You yeah, just book a chat, right? And you, and you can chat with three, four or five people at a time, yeah. right? So think about that now, it, it, like you probably run into this problem too. One of the problems that I create for people is I black out their calendars. I create fulfillment problems, right? Everybody says they can handle, you know, a hundred new students until they get them, <laughs> right? But part of the problem these companies have is like, even if they could 10X their leads, their salespeople can't handle them, right? Um, so, um, like, you'll get three or four times as many people to reach out by DM as you will book a call. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yep. Um, and your your virtual people can handle those, right? Because they can have multiple conversations going at once, right? Um so it's really a constraint in a lot of businesses. It just blows it out of the water when the constraint isn't like, oh, we got to send you to the salesperson first, right? But yeah, those those polls, like, yep. whew, I mean, that's how we make so much money so fast in little small communities, right? Because we're really mm -hmm. efficient. We basically boiled out everything that's not necessary, which is fill out the application schedule a call um 
show up to the call, all the small talk that has to happen before that and all this, all that kind of stuff. We've just boiled all that out of it, right? Get the committed people to raise their hand, ask them a couple questions. I'm, I'm making it sound easier than it is. It's not that easy when you're first getting it mapped together, but after you've asked them enough qualifying questions, you get it down to, I call the one or three like binary questions if they, mm -hmm. right? And then yep. you're like, okay, this person's going to be good to go, right? Um, uh, and it takes a little while to get it down to that, right? But it's the same thing with the sales calls. This is why the sales calls go on so long. They don't know what three questions to ask them. They'll get them to make a decision or to get them to see th that decision right then. And then we just drop them the offer in a Google document, sometimes in a video, uh, sometimes a combination uh, of those. We'll, a, we'll give a video and then the the text underneath or something like yeah. that. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people think that, you know, you need that sales call to build rapport and kind of do that discovery. But what I've found is that, you know, some, some offers I've been in, I, I ask them yeah. some questions about their current situation and I'll get a full paragraph. Uh, sometimes yeah. people might even feel more comfortable over text than absolutely. They will open up more during text. Um, and, and I'm not trying to beat up on people, but when you say your salesperson needs to build rapport on the call, <laughs> you're using the wrong tool. It would be like trying to use a screwdriver to pound the nail in. That's not what salespeople are for. They don't know. They don't, they're not understanding the difference between marketing and sales, right? You're pre-selling, which is the, my term for marketing. These people should be already pre-sold regardless if you're using DMs or salespeople, right? Sales, salesperson calls should be like 10 minutes or less. They should just, most of them should just go like, hey, are you ready to rock and roll or do you got a question, <laughs> right? Because, and I call these the six minute strategy session. If we do get on a call with somebody like, oh, right, that's usually how they go. They're like, hey, I just have one question and it's usually, like, I just want to make sure this works for me. So they just want to tell you about their situation a little bit. And you get these right. in the DMs too, right? Yeah. Like, hey, here's my situation. Then another, they just want to like, yeah, like this is totally what we do. Or, you know, or hey, this is totally what we do. As long as, right, you've got X, right? You're going to be great, right? Like like somebody, some kind of, hey, I'm a copywriter. I've written copy for big companies, right? Um, but I'm tired of being taking orders from them. I would want, I'm wanting to know if Ronan is for me. Right. And so I say, you're definitely ahead of the game. If you know how to write copy and you understand offers. Right. Um, but you have to be okay with talking to people and working deals and negotiating. Is that going to be a deal killer for you? Right. So I, I kind of do it that way. Not only not cause I'm trying to sell them, but I know they're going to have a miserable time if they're bashful. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So I, I'm, I'm qualifying them to be successful inside, but also lets them know I'm being real with them. I'm not just going to like blow smoke up their ass and say, yeah, this is great. Right. Um, but those are usually how those combos should go. So it's very frustrating if you've ever tried to, a nail in a nail with a pair of pliers, right? Or something that's not a hammer because you had to get it done, right? When I was a kid, like I used pliers on my bike for all the nuts and bolts and stuff. And you could do it a few times, but you'd round those suckers out, right? Like, and then you couldn't get them off anymore, right? And my dad changed my life when he showed me a socket set. It's the same thing. When business owners are like, well, we got to take them to a salesperson, right? So they can arm twist them for 60 or 90 minutes and develop that rapport, right? Um, they're not doing, the, they're using the wrong tool. It's very, very inefficient, right? They're using the wrong tool for the job and it changes everything when you start understanding like, hey, <laughs> that's not what salespeople are supposed to do, right? It also doesn't create any assets for the future. After that sales call is over, right? Like, there's no assets for the future, but in the DMs, right? 
or what, what do you mean by that assets in the future? Like, what would that look like? They're after the call's over, it's done. There's nothing left. Right. You get you get the credit card, and you got to do it all over again. Right. When we when we do it, like oh, we might get an objection, right? And we answer the objection in the DM. And they're like, oh man, this is great. I'm in. Boom. Now we can take that and go feed right. it into our marketing, and we yeah. have an asset, uh, right? We have an asset that, that we can sense. give to all of our other future tappers or virtual salespeople, right? Here's the, the best way to answer this, right? Or here's the way that it works, right? Mm -hmm. we, we're developing assets that we can use right. forever. Now, I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you can't take the recordings, right? But you got to, depending on what state you're in, you got to get your permission and, and then you have to rip the recordings, right? But, but typically you don't have any assets after the call. Our tappers, especially when we're starting out an offer, our tappers, right? Our salespeople are working with our marketing to like, oh, here's the objections. They put all their objections that they're getting in a sheet, right? And then we can send out marketing pieces to everybody. And what and what we have, we see is like people coming in, yep. uh, even if we don't put <laughs> links inside the marketing piece, because they're what I call fence sitters, right? They may have right. gotten the offer, but they haven't made up their mind yet. Then all of a sudden we send out an email, we make a post, you know, or whatever it is, and we answer that objection, they're like, oh, and we'll see two, three, four, five people like, okay, I'm in now, right? Like, does that make sense? Even without call to action in there. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, is it, I'm curious, is it true that you created PSM just so you can watch Breaking Bad and, <laughs> and make sales? <laughs> now you're telling everybody my flaws, right? So I know I'll never be successful because I'm one of those weird like non high performer um, guys that watches TV, right? Um, uh, I won't say I created it so I can watch um, Breaking Bad, but it sure makes me seem more useful, right? To my <laughs> wife when I can say, oh, <laughs> when I'm watching TV and say, oh, I just sold the $15,000 thing, right? Oh, good job, honey. <laughs> right? Why? Well, Why? Well, I'm watching it, right? But um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, I really don't sit around watching TV all day, but like I've watched Breaking Bad, like, I think I'm on my fourth time now or something like that. Like it's great writing and I, but I pulled pieces out of it. Right. But my philosophy is if you're don't have any free time, you're not very productive. So to me, free time. I call it loafing time. We call it loafing out here in the South, but mm -hmm. loafing time is signs that you live a very, like either you're dead broke, you're homeless, right? Or you're at the other end of the scale and living a very productive life, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's amazing. Like the things that homeless people have in common with the ultra or with the wealthy, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, it's like, Poor people take showers outside. Rich people put showers, you know, these showers outside, right? Like mm -hmm. there's a lot uh, of things, right? But um, to me, and I think even more so today, time is the new wealth, right? Um, time is the new wealth. So I optimize, and I don't even like the use the word time, mojo. My brand is mojo, which is energy because time is a, is a man-made invention. Right. All we really have is our energy. Like we're going to get so many units of energy from the time we're born to the time we die. Right. And so we want to manage those super carefully. Right. So we want to make sure we have leverage in our life. What is leverage? How do I get a thimble full of energy to do a truckload of output? Yeah. Right. Um, and thinking too hard about money <clears throat> and revering money too much. Or making money our master completely fucks that up, right? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if I can... <laughs> I'm about to edit it's that. Fun. Out. No, it's I get excited, <laughs> um, right? So, like to me, like if I don't have any calendar space, I don't have any time just to go sit out with my wife, look at the lake, and just talk for two hours. If I don't have like if I don't have time to go take a walk for a couple hours, if I don't have time to sit down, I do a lot of journal writing is how I think, right? So you can see my, I still do it. You can see my writer's bump there. Mm -hmm. um, but 
when I was a kid, that wasn't considered working, right? I was like me being lazy and I still have to fight that programming sometimes, right? That's my highest value work is me having that space to figure out where constraints are and how can I remove those constraints um, in my life, in money and relationships and all those kind of things. Where can I, what's the real cause? We have effects in our life. What's the real cause, right? And uh, so in answer to your question, no, I didn't invent it for Breaking Bad, but it sure allows me some time to rewatch S.H.I.E.L.D. and Breaking Bad. Jeannie and I are rewatching Lost right now. We started, we just, we started right. rewatching Lost. So, so there, there's um, something I read that you posted and you said that you shouldn't be chasing your passion. You should be chasing problems, which what you were talking about just now made me think about and when, when was it that you realized that was that just earlier in your life or was there a specific time? Later in my life. Um, it's always the, like your, your things that have always, your answers have always been right in front of you. Um, you just don't realize it. Right. My first info product was, I'm trying to think of what grade I was in. I think it was, I was in Arkansas. I think it was eighth grade or ninth grade. I don't remember how old I was, eighth, ninth grade or ninth grade. In Arkansas, we had little schools. It was all K through 12, all in the one school. But this is the early 80s, and the Rubik's Cube was like the big thing. But I wasn't smart enough to figure out how to do the Rubik's Cube. Um, I just couldn't figure it out. But we were at a Piggly Wiggly. They had a, these stores called Piggly Wigglies, which is a supermarket that are, this is where we shopped at, right? And they had these little, um, like where the candy is, they had these little stands of like little helpful booklets. And one was how to solve the Rubik's Cube. So I'm like, hot dang, right? Like, and I mowed lawns and stuff. So I, I bought that book on how to solve the Rubik's Cube. So I got it home and I'm like, I'm so excited. But there was too much memorization that I had to do, right? They would like show you something, then you had to memorize. They had these diagrams after d diagrams. We didn't have to memorize it, but you can look at the book. But you're not cool. You can't like, hey, watch me do this Rubik's Cube, right? <laughs> and follow instructions on the book, right? It's not, you don't get any coolness points for that. So I'm like, damn it, right? <laughs> and then we went to like Walmart somewhere and I went to their book section and they had several books on how to solve the Rubik's Cube. So I bought them all. <clears throat> and what I did was I ended up piecing out all the different methodologies from those books until I could put it all on one page cheat sheet, right? And there was some memorization that you had to do, right, on different things. But I basically boiled it all down, put it on a one page cheat sheet to where I could memorize that. Right. It was enough for a normal human being to memorize. And then I could do it without looking at it. Right. Um, so once I started doing that, the kids like, how are you doing that? Right. And so I would go at the time they didn't have Xerox copies. They had a, what's called a mimeograph machine and they smelled, smelled really bad, but I would let my teachers let me go back and mimeograph my cheat sheet. And then I'd go sell it for a couple bucks each, right? And then I'd pay for the pay the school back for the copies, but I'd get the money first and then pay them <laughs> back for the for the copies, right? Uh, but that was my first info product, right? So solving problems has always been there, right? Um, and of course, we're all designed to solve different problems uniquely. Some people solve, solve music problems, some people solve yep. painting problems, some people solve child rearing problems, right? Those kind of things. Uh, my favorite ones are money problems and flow problems, right? Um, and realizing that, that you can't go after money and make money, but you have to create assets to make money, right? You don't have to own the assets. You can just go get control of them. We're all kind of breakthroughs I made in solving the, those problems. So what I'm like super, I am passionate about it, but it starts with problem solving first, right? Is just taking normal people, right? That have been sold a I won't say bill of goods, but they've been sold that the only way to be prosperous is to 
suffer for 30 or 40 years saving everything that you can. So at the final end of it, you have a mountain of money, right? Maybe you save a million dollars and you can put it into 4% a month municipal bonds for 40 grand a year. That seems like a waste of fucking life to me, right? Like who wants to have a million dollars when they're 70? Like you want a million dollars when you're Kevin's age, right? <laughs> How do we get to that faster? Well, I try to call the 30 year wealth shortcut, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have to save up assets. We just have to go get control of them. The easiest assets to go get control of right now is intellectual property, right? People's products, people's lists, put them together. What's missing is the, the marketing IP or the pre-selling IP that we put into there, which we can either get somebody else to do that, or if we understand it, we can put it together. Yep. I'm starting to learn that now. Um, you're, you're talking about info products and what made me, what I me thinking about was, uh, I know you were creating relationship, uh, info products before. I'm just yeah. curious, are there any relationship kind of principles that you take to marketing that come to mind? Yes. Most of my marketing principles are based off of relationship principles because business okay. is about people, right? So like, you know, when I, uh, taught you and everybody like the way I, we do is we talk about coffee dates first mm -hmm. and then a first date, which is usually a test <laughs> and then a, a going steady period and then a marriage, right? You're a website designer, right? They try to go straight from hello to let's get married, right? Let us mm -hmm. handle all your website needs. It's going to be 50 grand up front and then $2,000 a month to SEO it or whatever it is that's a big marriage, right? And it's really, really risky. It's much better to like say, how do we, how do we do this normally in relationships? We usually have coffee dates and our coffee dates may be the content that we put out, right? right. Um, or <clears throat> books that we have or whatever. Um, or if we, if we, if you're a video guy, your YouTube channel, but you have your coffee dates and then you have a test or a first date, right? Um, like when I go in and, and either do some licensing for a company or whatever, I don't say, hey, let's do this big licensing program, right? It's going to be three years long, but I'm not sure if it's going to work or not. Let's do a test. I just call it a test. I don't say, hey, let's go on our first date with them. Yep. Let's just run a little test because there's usually, if it's something new, right? So let's take to your guy that's like, the only way we can sell this is if we get them on the phone for an hour and a half and build rapport, right? I'm not yep. saying you're wrong. But what if we just did a little test? What if we sent two or three emails to your list? Let my guy see if we could close them over the over the DMs. And maybe we won't. Maybe you're right. Right. But if we can do it, like look at all the places that we can apply to it. So then we're talking about marriage later down. But right now, let's forget about all that. Let's just test it. And a lot of times they think, yeah, okay, that sounds great. And then on the test, we get to see how they are. They get to see if we chew with our mouths open or you know, maybe they're, they don't do what they say they're going to do. Right. And we can decide like, Oh my goodness. Like, well, dinner was good, but I don't see much point in us continuing on. Right. Does that make sense? So, um, and then as you like, usually on that first date, if the first date goes well, the second date happens naturally. It's like, Oh my God. Mm -hmm. yep, like I've we go that. on there and like, if I make somebody any amount of money, right. Cause the way we, the kind of way we work, um, and I'm just, I know you know this, but I'm talking to you. The way yeah, we yeah. work, it's like, don't give me a dime up front. Don't give me any money up front, right? I'm good enough at what we do that I'll either make it rain for you and you pay us out after it hits your Stripe account, right? Right? Or you don't owe us anything. I'm going to invest my time, my energy, my know-how, my IP in what you're doing. And if it works, right, then you pay me, right? And we're good at, and I know what people to work with and those kind of things that mm -hmm. most of the time, like we have lots of upside. We're going to make, you know, 50 grand, hundred grand on the test, even on a failure, we still make money. I just had, I don't know if you know, Tony T but he just had a mm -hmm. failure. He made it, he did a hundred grand in sales, but it just wasn't enough <laughs> for him, right? He had like a, I think he made like 26 grand. He had like a 25% uh, yep. rev share on it. <laughs> um, he's just like, nah. <laughs> right but of course he's a, he's advanced he's usually yep. like 
you just did a three hundred thousand dollar campaign, right? Um, so I mean, it's a little advanced, but even the failures, right? It's like having a coin that you say. If it comes up heads, I want it to come up heads. If it comes up heads, you make 50 grand. If it comes up tails, right, you make five grand. Right? The whole thing is just flip it faster. Now, when guys are first getting started out, it may be like heads is 10 grand and they might lose $200 on a tails, right? Or $300 mm -hmm. in some time, right? Does that make sense? But yep. given those odds, you just flip the damn coin, right? And there's abundant opportunities there's never been more influencers with huge followings on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Facebook groups, Twitter, right? They've all got eyeballs, right? And most of them aren't good at monetizing, right? 100%. There's never been more software as a service companies, right? Where you can go partner up with a software as a service company, right? So you sell it once, right? And you get paid month after month after month after month, right? That's why I'm always like, God dang, there's so much opportunity out there. There's like kids in a candy store, right? But it takes that mind shift. you like, and I'm not against owning a business, but sometimes a, a business, like if I'm just selling skincare products, I'm not going to think about all these other opportunities. If I'm just focused on skincare. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. We need that, right? But kind of what we do is roam in like people that serve no master, right? Including money, mm -hmm. including being tied to a, a, a single business, right? We see all these things, right? And there's so much opportunity. We have to be careful about which one we pick. Absolutely. Right? Um, and that's kind of the shift, right? Yeah. Wrapping up. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. There's a whole bunch of opportunity there for people who uh, know how to utilize PSM, phone, uh, phoneless sales machine. Uh, I've seen it for myself personally, and uh, and I get that all the time. Whenever I talk to new partners, they have, you know, they're stuck at trying to operate the business and be the salesperson yeah. as well. Yeah. Great. So yeah, great. Thanks so much, Travis, uh, for sharing all that knowledge there. Uh, Welcome, PSM, it was fun. Yeah, a huge fan of it. Um, I, I'm I'm you're trying to spread the like, word. I don't do these things. interviews very yeah. often, but you're <laughs> in the. Ronin group, right? Um, yep. So I'm like happy to, to do anything I can for the Ronin folks. So, yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Travis.